going to turn tonight to the book of Leviticus, if you will. The book of, Levit of Leviticus. We're going to be looking at the, uh, the 19th chapter. Let's begin reading at verse 27. Ye shall not round the corners of your heads, neither shalt thou mar the corners of thy beard. Ye shall not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead, nor print any marks upon you. I am the Lord. Let's stop reading there and look to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we do ask now that we would <clears throat> gather in this room with humble hearts, realizing that without you, we know nothing. Without you, we can do nothing. Without you, life has no meaning that we can discover. And I pray that we would gather here, Lord, tonight, understanding these things, with the kind of dependence that should characterize Christians for our every understanding in every area of life. And we ask this in the name of our Savior, the Lord Jesus, and for his sake, amen. Since the Garden of Eden, man has declared his independence from God. By nature, man is determined to define the world that he lives in and himself without God. It's because it's in our nature. And it's been that way since the very beginning. And it's that way today. And I believe even in the life of the genuine believer, we sense this constant struggle against independence or against dependence upon God and in favor of independence from him to this very day. So much of life is about becoming what we want to be and do without certainty of either. Some time ago, I realized something that began to dawn on me. I guess it's been pretty near 40 years ago, maybe a little better, that life involves an identity quest. It, it involves an identity quest um, where we're trying to find out who we are. We're, we're trying to discover who we are, uh, why we're in the world, uh, we're trying to discover why right is right and wrong is wrong by most people's definition. And we begin to question everything at some point. And we begin to define things for ourselves. That's our nature. That's the way we are. To think for ourselves, to define for ourselves. And in the course of all of this, the truth is we really do not know who we are. And we're desperately trying to figure out who we are, where we came from, why we're here, where we're going, all without God. 
In this identity quest, some find identity in joining clubs. Some find identity in joining gangs. Some find identity in joining various religious denominations. And their identity is all bound up in that group that they associate with. Some find identity in their immediate friends who share similar interests. It gives people a sense of purpose and uh, a belongingness need. Some find identity by vicariously associating themselves with certain Hollywood actors or music rock stars. I'm always amused by the discovery that there are literally hundreds around the world who have turned impersonating Elvis Presley into a personal vocation. I mean, who just go around the world uh, portraying themselves as Elvis Presley. Why? Why would somebody do that? Well, it's because of this identity quest. People do not know who they are. And they desperately want to be important. Everybody does. Uh, everybody wants to be popular, to be loved by the people around them. Uh, everybody wants personal significance. And sometimes the efforts to get that finds expression in rather bizarre forms. This uh, message tonight is going to be one in a series on various other topics that have to do with Christian living. I have had so many people saying that we need messages that have to do with Christian living. And so I'm going to try to do that, even though it's not my favorite kind of thing, because I always make people mad teaching some of these things. Um, because people have a knack for thinking that what you're doing is targeting, targeting them, that you know something about them, and so you're getting up in the pulpit and preaching about them. Nothing could be further from the truth. I don't know anything apart from this book. I don't know anything worth knowing apart from this book. And so help me, when I study the scriptures, my desire is to find the mind of God. How he thinks is the only thing that matters. It's going to be the only thing that matters when you die. And if that's true, then it should be the only thing that matters while you live. If you want to know how to live... <clears throat> The way to live is to understand what's important when you die. And I can tell you now that there's nothing more important than knowing the Lord Jesus Christ personally, knowing how he thinks, and being able to reflect back over your life to, re to discover with joy in your heart that many years earlier, hopefully, we were those who received Jesus Christ as our personal Savior in truth. And we were converted. We were changed. And from that point on, it was our desire to be like him and to do those things that were pleasing in his sight. Folks, I cannot think of anything that could describe better a successful life than that. And so tonight, I'm going to speak on the subject of the tattoo culture. The tattoo culture. I'm sure that you've noticed it. I don't see how you could miss it. I would say that in the last five years even, 
there's been a flood of people getting tattoos. This past summer, when I would go downtown, sometimes to places like Walmart or Lowe's, I would see men in there and they would be covered. Not just little tattoos, I mean tattoos all over them, all around their neck, all up and down their arms, their legs. I see girls with tattoos. I photographed a wedding back some time ago, and, and this girl had a beautiful wedding gown on. She was a bridesmaid, or not a wedding gown, as a bridesmaid, and, and the, the back part was, was open all the way down to the waist, just a big, wide, open back. And her back was completely covered with uh, floral type colorations. And I looked at that and uh, the thought that just came to me, and I, I don't know but what it, it wasn't even just natural as well as my understanding from scripture. I was just amazed at why a person would do that. I didn't understand. Because this was an attractive girl. She certainly did not need a tattoo to attract attention. She was very attractive just naturally. But we're seeing this more and more. I'm amazed at how many of the Hollywood actresses, I mean many of them that are just absolutely stunningly beautiful women, have tattoos now. And... Uh, and you see it everywhere. And more and more, it's becoming a part of our culture. The reason I'm addressing this subject is because Calvary Memorial Church has a responsibility to address these issues so that the generation coming along knows how to think about it, knows how to understand it. It's not enough to get up and, and tell people, well, uh, the Bible's got a verse in it that says something pretty emphatic about tattoos and that they're not what the Lord wants for his people. I think that there is a responsibility in the church to explain why in such a way that people who know the Lord and love the Lord can really understand it with the understanding so that it becomes a part of them, their way of thinking. And we owe it to the young people that are coming along because they're under a tremendous influence to go out there and get a tattoo. And many of the teenagers are. By the droves nowadays, it's become a fad. It's become part of the pop culture that we live in. I want to read to you a couple of articles that I lifted out of the, off of the internet. Uh, by the way, if anybody is interested in that subject, the internet is just loaded, absolutely loaded with this stuff. But one of them said this in the way of a brief overview of the subject. Tattoos have experienced a resurgence in popularity in many parts of the world, particularly in North and South America, Japan, and Europe. During the first decade of the 21st century, the presence of tattoos became evident within pop culture, inspiring television shows such as A&E's Inked and TLC's Miami Inc and L.A. Inc. The declaration of blues singers, uh, singer Janis Joplin with a wristlet and a small heart on her left breast by the San Francisco tattoo artist Lyle Tuttle has been called a seminal moment, moment in the popular acceptance of tattoos as art. Tattoos are generally considered an important part of the culture of the Russian mafia, says that. 
Formal interest in the art of the tattoo has become prominent in the 1990s through the beginning of the 21st century. Contemporary art ex exhibitions and visual art institutions have featured tattoos as art through such means as displaying tattoo flash, examining the works of tattoo artists, or otherwise incorporating examples of body art into mainstream exhibits. One such 2009 Chicago exhibition called Freaks and Flash featured both examples of historic body art as well as the tattoo artists which produced it. In many traditional cultures, tattooing has also enjoyed a resurgence. Partially in deference to cultural heritage, historically a decline in traditional tribal tattooing in Europe occurred with the, the spread of Christianity. However, some Christian groups, such as the Knights of St. John of Malta, sported tattoos to show their allegiance. A decline often occurred in other cultures following European efforts to convert aboriginal and indigenous people to Western religious and cultural practices that held tattooing to be a pagan or heathen activity. Within some traditional indigenous cultures, tattooing takes place within the context of a rite of passage between adolescence and adulthood. One of the individuals that I found on the internet uh, goes by the name Bondage Kit. That's their, their name, Bondage Kit. And the article that this person had written uh, had the uh, title, Let Your Darker Side Give In. Let Your Darker Side Give In. And it went on, and I, we don't have the time to go into all of this, and so uh, this is somewhat abbreviated. But this young man explained how growing up in his home, he knew that such things would never be accepted and that many in uh, his acquaintance would look with disapproval if he were to get a tattoo, but he wanted to, he wanted to have one. And very secretly, he had these various beliefs that he really didn't want to share with anyone because he knew that if he did, there would be a multitude of people that would be offended, especially his parents, if they knew how he really believed. And so he kept putting it off, kept putting it off until he got into his 20s. Finally, when he went off to college and was somewhat liberated from the home and his parents and so forth, he finally decided to let his darker side give in which is the caption for this article that he wrote. And he had tattooed on his ankle the word pain, pain. And he admitted that he was somewhat of a masochist sexually. And this had deep meaning to him, deep meaning. And he wanted that term tattooed on his ankle so that in the future, if anybody asked him about it, he could explain what it meant because he was no longer ashamed of it. He thought of it as being him, a definition of him, his thoughts and his philosophy. There was another um, person that I found on there, uh, a girl by the name of Beth. And she had a tattoo uh, in the words, in the Latin words, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And she had that tattooed on her in Latin. Um, so she says to every religious person or vigilante out there, these words are instantly recognizable. 
I'll never forget the first time I saw The Boondock Saints, which is a movie. I've never seen it, never heard of it, but it says here that it was a movie. She attended this movie, and it says at the end of the movie, I turned to my friend and said, Dude, can we do this? He's been calling me VJ ever since, which means vigilante justice. That's what the movie was all about, vigilante justice. Then she says, I'm not noticeably Irish or religious, but that phrase to me means what all of my tattoos have meant. I do what I do. Or officially, in this case, I am my own father, son, and Holy Ghost. And no law is above my own. My mom, however, just thinks I've turned to my faith in her Savior. So she doesn't honestly communicate what it means to her, but she tells us and the world on the Internet what it means. It's a language. Tattoos are a language. And it communicates. So we're living in a culture, and there's a desperation that characterizes our culture. And the des desperation involves an identity quest, an identity quest. The desperation is tremendously important. To people. The desperation to be important as they're seen by others, to be recognized among the masses as important. And sometimes this passion to be recognized again, takes on some pretty bizarre forms. I was in Fedville the other week, and I went into a short shop, and there was a girl in there, and when I looked at her, so help me, it was painful to my eyes. It was painful to my eyes. She had a bolt through her tongue, and when she would talk, it was so big that um, you couldn't help but see it. She had rings through her lips. She had a bolt stuck through her nose. She had rings through her eyebrows. It was painful just to look at. I believe her reason for doing that was not because the majority of the world is blind. The majority of the world has eyes that work. It was for being seen. She desperately wanted to be seen. She desperately wanted attention brought to herself, and if the only way she could get it was by looking bizarre, then that's what she was going to do to get it. When I see people like that, it's the equivalent of them waving a flag and saying, please look at me, please notice me, I so desperately want some kind of personal importance. I so desperately want to be a part of life that's significant, that's important. Please look at me. Please pay me some attention. And so this desperation 
manifests itself a lot of times in some very bizarre forms, gross piercings, mutilations. There was a fellow that used to work at Walmart that had um, a great big um, device of some sort stuck through his earlobe right here where he had gradually stretched it to the point that he could get this this thing in there. I don't know what it was, but it was about this big around, and his ear actually had grown around this thing. I noticed it. There's no way that you could walk through Walmart without noticing this if you met him. And then he had a few other things, but th that was the most noticeable thing, was the gigantic earlobes that he had. There's been a time when you would pull down a National Geographic magazine and you could see those kind of things because it, it's, a, it's a part of the culture in certain parts of Africa among the black people there. They do things like stretching the neck and stretching their bottom lip to where it's huge, just stretched way out here. And sometimes it's huge objects through the years, just like we're seeing in America today. That's considered a pagan culture that does those kinds of things. And we're seeing young people today who are doing the same kind of thing here in America. And it's conspicuous beyond imagination. You can't miss it. And it's our responsibility to explain, to explain why in a place like this, in the church of God, so that we can understand it. What is Calvary Memorial Church going to be like 10, 15 years on down the road if the Lord tarries? What are the people in the congregation going to look like? What are the children going to look like? Brother Charles brought a message on Sunday about, you know, the stormy seas and being out on the sea and the, the ship, the disciples with the Lord and how the water got into the ship. And he explained it as the world getting into the church. What we're doing here at Calvary Memorial Church is trying to hang on for dear life in this incredible storm that we see all over the world as the world pulls at the church and tears at the church and tries to lure away the young people into the world, as the world tries to come into the church and it's going both ways, some of the children are leaving the church and going out into the world. And in many cases, the world is coming into the church and you can see it right down the road. It's in many of the churches. And so I believe it's our responsibility to address these things. Again, it's not enough to say that tattooing is wrong. It is wrong. The scripture is very clear about it. But the young generation that's coming along need to know why. They need to be taught why. So Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 28 says, Ye shall not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead, nor print any marks upon you. I am the Lord. Reason number one that tattoos are wrong is because the Lord says so. He says, I am the Lord. It's wrong because I say so. Reason number two, we do not, as believers, belong to ourselves, contrary to what the pop culture says. We do not belong to ourselves. When you get saved, you belong to the Lord. And here's what he says, 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 19, what? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. For ye are bought with a price. 
Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Which are God's. We are not our own. We're not free spirits, as the 60s generation believed, to live down here on this world and to do our own thing. We're bought with a price, bought with the precious blood of Christ. And so that's reason number two for not getting tattoos. We do not belong to ourselves. And not belonging to ourselves, the Lord himself said, I don't want it. I do not want it. It is wrong. Reason number three. We are called the body of Christ by the Lord. That's what we're referred to in Scripture as the body of Christ. Now, the head of the body is the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul explained that there in Corinthians. In other words, the mind of the body of Christ is that of Jesus Christ. Let that mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God. And so we are the body of Christ, and our head is Jesus Christ. And the kind of thinking that goes on in our lives should parallel with the teachings of Scripture, 100%. It doesn't say let 99% of the mind of Christ be your mind. It says let that mind be in you. That was also in Christ Jesus, in totality. That means that what we think is totally irrelevant. It doesn't mean anything. We don't know anything anyway, apart from what the Lord has told us in his word. We do not know the truth on any subject whatsoever under heaven, apart from the message of this book. That is knowledge that is meaningful as it relates to everything else that we might know. And so we are the body of Christ, and that's a third reason why we should understand that tattoos are wrong. If the Lord refers to us as his body, the question that we need to ask ourselves is, is that what the Lord would do to himself? Would he go into a tattoo parlor if he was in the living here in the 20th century and say, I would like to get a tattoo of a skull or some flower or some phrase tattooed on his body. Do you think the Lord Jesus would do that? Do you think that that is in his thought life? I don't. I don't. Any more than I believe that Jesus had long hair. I know the Lord Jesus did not have long hair as he's portrayed in the uh, paintings of the artists that obviously did not study the Bible and know the scriptures, especially 1 Corinthians 14, where it teaches you, does not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it's a shame to him. Jesus Christ would not tell us to have short hair as men if he had long hair. It's amazing how much the Bible has to say about how we look. I'd like for you to turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 2. First Timothy chapter 2 and verse 9. Now keep in mind, this is the revelation from heaven in this case to the Apostle Paul, who was moved by the Holy Ghost, not writing his opinion. This was God pouring out his understanding, his way of thinking to the people of this world and to us here tonight. 
First Timothy chapter 2 and verse 9. In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Now, when you think about what is said here in verse 9, about modest apparel, the very look on your face, shamefacedness. In other words, there's a, there's a prideful look. And then there is a look that you can display that the world will see that is a language. Just facial expression is a language. Uh, I've heard parents say to their children, don't look at me with those words. <laughs> because just a look communicates an attitude. It communicates language. And so the Lord is saying, when it comes to appearance, I want you to even be concerned about your facial expression as other people see you. And then he talks about not uh, plated or plaited hair, I think is the way you pronounce it, uh, or gold or pearls or costly array. What, what is he talking about here? Well, I think what he's talking about is uh, dressing in such a way that you become conspicuous in a crowd. Is, not, is that not what it means? Isn't this the point that the Lord is making? That, that we're supposed to live in this world in such a way that we're inconspicuous. We're, we're not going around trying to say, you know, here I am. Look, somebody please pay attention to me. Please look at me. Please look at me. That's not why we're here in the world. You know, the Lord, Jesus was so, the Lord Jesus was so inconspicuous. Judas had to kiss him in the Garden of Eden so that the, the soldier, the, the, the Pharisees the, and the, scri the, uh, the scribes and, and the soldiers would know who to, to arrest. He didn't stand out in the crowd. He grew up as a tender plant. And when people saw him, there was no comeliness that they would desire him. That's what Isaiah the prophet said. He was very inconspicuous. Many times he escaped in the midst of people because he immediately blended in with the way other people looked. There was nothing conspicuous about him at all. That's in subtle contrast to what you see in young people today that are desperately crying out, please look at me. And again, in bizarre ways to get attention, to get somebody to look at them and give them attention. You see this kind of behavior sometimes in the school here with uh, little children that are coming up in the elementary school and they, they begin to like a girl. And so their bizarre way of getting them to notice them is to run by them and hit them in the shoulder good and hard. Or stomp their foot. And the girl stands there and cries and does the very opposite of what he really wants. He wants her to love him. But that doesn't work. It doesn't work. And neither does working in a short shop with your face so pierced that when people come in and look at you, they grimace. It's a kind of mental sickness that characterizes a world of people who do not know God. And because they do not know God, they cannot know who they are.
And so they're desperately on this quest trying to find some kind of definition for themselves. It shouldn't be that way for anybody that attends Calvary Memorial Church. We of all the people in the world ought to know exactly who we are. And we ought to be teaching our children that sit at our feet all the time, continually, about the ways of the world and, and, and what the Lord wants and, and how we should appear in this world to be a good testimony for him. I have um, two granddaughters now, and a grandson. I think that I would faint inside if Alexis one day showed up at the door and had tattoos on her it would break my heart it would if my little grandson uh, showed up at the door with tattoos on him it would break my heart and I'm going to tell you something as a grandpa. My grandchildren are going to hear from me the word of the Lord. And I'm going to teach them so that 20 years down the road, when they're coming to Calvary Memorial Church, they're going to look right. They're going to look right. And I'm going to take a stand against the world. And I don't care how many people out here in the world are going for this, this, this fad. It's offensive. It's offensive in every way. So the Lord is very concerned about how we appear, and, and the Bible has all kinds of information in it about that. The Lord had something to say about the way a woman wore her hair or how she wore jewelry. In 1 Peter chapter 3, and verse 3, it says, Whose adorning, let it not be the outward adorning of the plating of the hair, or of wearing of gold, or of putting on of apparel. So Peter is repeating what Paul said to Timothy. Same words. The Lord did not want his people appearing in public in a conspicuous manner so that it drew attention to the self. That's not why we're in the world. Why are we in the world? What does it mean to be a witness? Is it not to point people to Christ? Is it not to make him conspicuous to the world? When people see Dwight Creech, I want them to know that I'm a Christian. I want them to know that. And I pray every day that the Lord will give me opportunities to talk to people, and it's difficult. It's difficult. You have to be very careful because you can't talk to people on a one-to-one -one basis the way you can talk about these kinds of things from a pulpit. It's completely different. It's completely different. And you have to win people's respect. You have to get to know them and become a part of their life to the point that they feel comfortable around you and safe around you. And they grow to respect you. And as you begin to interchange ideas back and forth and, and, and you, you try to be careful as much so as possible, from time to time they'll invite you into expressing what you believe, what you stand for. And the Lord will open a door for you from time to time. And that's a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful thing. I'll tell you what. If you go to a lot of young people that are in this church, if you were to go to a lot of the young people in this church, 20 years from now and begin to talk to them about some of these things, it'll make them mad as all what? Be too late. Too late. Especially after people have become settled in a certain way of thinking and it becomes a part of their life. It's better to be able to teach young people the truth while they're young. The Lord was critical of the way the Pharisees dressed. In Luke chapter 20 and verse 46, it says, Beware of the scribes, he said, 
which desire to walk in long robes and love greetings in the markets and the high seats in the synagogues and the chief rooms at feasts. The way they dress was offensive to God. It's not good to dress in a conspicuous way. Men can even wear a suit in such a way as to stand out from the crowd. Of course, I need to be careful because I did not wear a tie tonight. I don't like ties. <laughs> but I, I hope it's not offensive. But sometimes you can dress up with a really fancy suit with the whole nine yards, you know, the, the, the Kleenex thing sticking out of the pocket and pins all over it, you know, like you're a four-star general and all this kind of stuff. That's conspicuous. I don't like that. My wife will tell you, I, I don't like to stand out. I, I really don't. I, I like plain clothes. I don't like flashy clothes. Never have. I like plain clothes. And the thing I've got going in my favor in that regard is I, I even like that naturally speaking. I just don't like flashy clothing. Um, I don't like jewelry. I don't want a necklace or, or whatever you call it, a chain around my neck, gold chain or bracelets. I don't, I don't like that kind of thing. Um, Listen to this. The Lord actually delights in clothing us. And, and it says so right here in the Bible. Listen to this. Matthew chapter 6, beginning at verse 28. And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the, the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things did the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. The tattoo culture has precious little to do with what we might think about it personally. I realized years ago when I was at East Carolina University, I came to a watershed moment in my life, a place where two roads met, and I was faced with a decision which road I was going to take. And with one of those roads, anything that life would ever mean, I had the burden of having to give it a definition and a meaning. And it was a weighty burden to me. Because I knew I would be all alone in life with the burden of having to decide, to decide every single issue that I would ever confront I would have to make a decision about what would be right or what would be wrong. I also knew that I would have to face death itself with my own philosophy. And I began to realize that I was so ignorant, so profoundly ignorant about so many things. If I couldn't define life and give life meaning, which I was having a real struggle doing. Because a lot of the things that I thought were going to work didn't. And I crashed and burned several times, thinking that my way was the right way. Turned out not to be the right way at all. I finally came to the conclusion that if I could not 
give life meaning. I certainly could not muster up any serious expectation of what was going to become of me beyond the grave. I didn't have a clue. I didn't have a clue as to what was out there. I really could not understand evolution. I could not understand how I could have evolved. I couldn't understand that. I didn't see how that was possible. And God in his grace and his mercy visited me. And he showed me the right road to take. And I took it. I did. I made a decision. I took it. When I took it, I immediately, immediately began to seek out my professors that I had become real close friends with. Dr. Clinton Pruitt, chairman of the psychology department, I went to his home and I witnessed to him. I told him that I had received Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. And I said, the Bible is the truth. And Sigmund Freud is not the father of psychology. Jesus Christ is. I went to Dr. John Covey at Cozy's office. He was the chairman of the Department of Philosophy. I was a philosophy major as well. I went to his house. I sat down and talked with him about the Lord. I later wrote a, a paper on metaphysics. He was offended in me. He didn't like my metaphysics. And he summons me into his office and he told me, he said, you either shape up or ship out of this park. This is not the kind of philosophy that we're interested in, the philosophy of Jesus Christ. And he told me that. Dr. Ray Lanfear was a very close friend of mine in the Department of Philosophy. He tried to encourage me to go with him to Missoula, Montana, where he became chairman of the Department of Philosophy out there. Offered to help me get a doctorate in philosophy, studying under him. I got saved. I was a close friend with Dr. Ray Lanfear. He was formerly a Baptist minister that apostatized. I sat in his home many times talking with him about those things. But the Lord saved me. Not long after that, I was offered a job down this area, working for the state as a juvenile corrections counselor. And I found this church and Brother Kent and began to read different books. And I came across a book by Dr. M. Marty Hahn, and I sent it to Dr. Ray Lanfear in the hopes that he would read it and think about it. It was written by a physician, a very intelligent man, but a Christian. That was what was so important about it. He knew the Lord. Dr. Ray Lanfear wrote me back and said, as you recall in a previous conversation, I went down this road and found it to be quite unsatisfactory. I am returning the book, for I am sure I will never read it. That's almost a verbatim quote of the letter. And that was many years ago, close to 40 years ago. Folks, um, we're here in this world to be a testimony to the world for the Lord Jesus Christ of how he thinks and what he likes, what he likes in terms of the way we live. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, keep my, my commandments. Tattooing is a language. It's no different from the language of music or an artist brush. An artist is communicating a philosophy of life with his 
brush. It's true in photography. I've had people who were willing to pay me big money to photograph nudes. I don't do that. I don't photograph things that are bad testimony. I will not. Everything that we do communicates. It's a language. Facial expression is language. The way we dress is language. The jewelry we wear, our hair, it's language, it communicates, it's testimony. We want to be a testimony to the world of how the Lord thinks, what his personality is like, what his nature is like. Every characteristic that we would expect to see in the Lord Jesus Christ if he was physically here, that's what we ought to communicate. That should be our testimony to the world. Um, there's a tremendous need, and I'll just close with this thought. There's a tremendous need to clearly define these things. The Word of God divides. It divides. It puts a difference between the people of God and the Egyptians. It puts a difference. And the preaching in this church has got to be plain enough that no one can make any mistake about it, what is right and what is wrong. And I'm here to tell you, as a Bible teacher, tattooing is wrong. It's wrong. It's a terrible testimony. And we do not want it for our children. We want to train up our children in the way they should go. And that's not the way they should go. I pray the Lord will help us to understand these things. Let's look to him in prayer. Father, we thank you for your precious word. Bless our understanding. Help us to be a humble people that will take these things and apply them the way they should be in our lives. And how we do pray, Lord, for the future generation of young people whose responsibility it will be to carry on this ministry. It's a great struggle, that of keeping the world out of the church. But we can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth us. And our eyes are upon thee for the future of this church. We'll make this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.